So everyone, thank you for coming today. Uh, my name is Jennifer. Um, and today we're really excited to welcome Dr. Sturks, Dr. Sylvie Sturks from the University of Zurich. Um, Dr. Sturz did a postdoc at Mount Sinai with Dr. Peter Polisi um, and has been very pivotal, pivot, pivotal sorry, in uh, understanding viral entry, specifically in influenza viruses. Um, and the cool thing is she's not just looking at human infective human, uh, influenza viruses, but how, those, how this entry process can spill over from zoonotic infections. Um, and with this, this means she's been very well funded by the Novartis Research Institute and the Swiss National Science Foundation. Um, and we're really excited today to hear about her work on um, how influenza viruses use a novel entry receptor, um, which is the MHC class two um, receptor protein to infect cells and to, I think, broadly infect cells. Um, and we're really excited to have you today. Yeah, thank you, Jennifer, for this kind introduction. And also thank you for the invitation to share some of our uh, recent work with you today. This, I think, is working, no? You can see my slides now? Uh, yes, you're good. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so before I go into the, the topic of MHC class 2 as a novel entry receptor for influenza A viruses, I would like to give you a short introduction to influenza, in particular about their zoonotic potential and about how they enter their host cells um, to make sure we're all on the same page. You all know that influenza is a respiratory disease in humans that is caused by flu A and flu B viruses. And for today, we're only going to focus on flu A, which is the ones that have zoonotic potential. We have about three to five million severe infections per year um, and up to 650,000 deaths per year, according to WHO. So this is a real um, burden on human health. But unfortunately, it's also um, a problem in different animals. Um, so flu A can affect, uh, infect um, birds, dogs, horses, pigs. And especially when there are large outbreaks in pig farms or chicken farms, these um, events come with very high costs. So influenza is a global health problem and a huge economic uh, burden. And so we need to study um, to understand these viruses. One of the hallmarks of these uh, viruses is their very broad host range. Um, so for most influenza viruses, the reservoir is waterfowl, geese, ducks, swans, they um, carry a large number of these influenza A viruses, and usually they do not cause disease in these birds. And then you have um, sometimes spillover uh, of these viruses into other animals, horses, dogs, pigs, for example. And in most cases, nothing will happen. The virus infection will die off because these viruses are not fit or not adapted to the other host. But in rare events, you do have a virus that is um, by chance fit enough to replicate in this other um, host, and the virus can establish a lineage. So for example, we have viruses that are really specific to dogs and circulate in the dog population. We have horse viruses, we have uh, viruses circulating in the pigs. And as you all know, we also have human influenza viruses that now circulate only um, in humans. Um, and these are the H1N1 and H3N2 viruses that currently circulate in humans in the, the winter season. And the virus is a very simple enveloped RNA virus. And today we're only interested in the surface proteins, the glycoproteins of the virus. There is the neuraminidase that comes in 11 different subtypes. And there is the HA, the hemagglutinin that comes in 18 different subtypes. And you then list the subtype, for example, H1N1 would have a hemagglutinin of subtype one and a neuraminidase of subtype one to characterize these viruses. And this HA, this is really the main determinant of entry. This is the protein that gets the virus into the cell. So influenza viruses bind with the HA protein to silic acid. And silic acid is the terminal, terminal glycan on many glycolipids and glycoproteins. And specifically, influenza viruses um, recognize or bind this um, linkage between silic acid and the penultimate sugar, which is galactose. 
However, not all influenza A viruses have the exactly same specificity, and there is a quite famous and well-studied difference between influenza viruses from avian hosts and from influenza viruses of mammalian hosts, such as the human ones. The human viruses, they bind silic acid with an alpha-2,6 linkage. So this refers to this linkage between silic acid and the galactose. And the avian ones, they bind alpha-2,3 linked silic acid. And you can see that this small difference makes quite a difference when you look at the overall structure. And this has been studied really for decades. And we now know that this difference in receptor specificity really has profound implications for zoonotic transmission of these viruses. If an avian influenza virus is um, successful in a mammalian host, it has to undergo this switch. This is really essential. Um, the preference needs to change from 2,3 to 2,6 linked salic acid. It's not enough, um, but it is required. It's one of the major determinants of zoonotic um, transmission. And um, uh, this, this setting where we thought we knew very well about receptor specificity of these viruses and how that determines zoonotic potential, that got a bit mixed up or um, uh, changed things a little bit when these two studies came out almost 10 years um, um, ago. This was a team from the CDC that looked for novel viruses in bats in Central and South America. And they found novel genome sequences of influenza A viruses from bats. The first one they described was from a bat of this type in uh, Guatemala. And the second one they found in Peru from these fruit eating bats. Um, and what they saw is that these viruses were quite distinct from the known influenza viruses, and they were then um, called as a separate subtype, H17 and 10 and H18 and 11. And it's important to note here that they um, described or isolated complete genome sequences from fecal samples, but they could not recover infectious virus from these um, samples. This is usually not a big deal for influenza viruses because we have very efficient reverse genetic systems where we can generate the viruses recombinantly. But here, these reverse genetics attempts failed, and that was a bit um, odd. Um, when you now look at the genome sequences of these viruses, for six out of the eight genomic segments of the virus, it looks like that. And this is the H17 example. Um, all the, the representatives of the known flu A viruses class here, sorry. Um, and then this red one would be the sequence of the bat flu virus. So you see it's quite distinct from the others, but it's still closer to the flu A's compared to the flu B or flu C. However, the segments encoding the two glycoproteins were a bit different from that. If you look at the NA um, segment, this is even further away from the other flu A viruses um, and even further away also from flu B. So if you only looked at the NA encoding segment, you wouldn't even class these viruses as influenza A viruses. And it was then very surprising that for the HA, the exact opposite was the case. So the HA segment groups very nicely within the other HA segments of the known influenza A viruses. So here you see that it's really the same distance between this H17 and let's say H2 or H1 uh, compared to H9 and H8 or something like that. So here it looked like a very normal um, influenza virus. And this raised quite some questions. So we had the um, old picture with the avian reservoir and the spillovers. And now based on seven out of these eight segments, you would say that these bat influenza viruses, they are a completely separate reservoir, completely distinct. However, with the HA um, segment, you would argue that maybe there is some crosstalk or some interaction. Could there be some genetic mixing because the HA is quite closely related? And so given that we know the zoonotic potential of influenza viruses and what that can mean um, for human health, we thought this was something that we should study in more detail and find out about these um, somewhat funny bat influenza viruses. 
And for us as an entry lab, things got even more interesting when people started to study these proteins. We still didn't have the virus, but one could produce the proteins. And it was found that the neuraminidase from these bad viruses does not possess any neuraminidase activity. So again, very different from the conventional influenza A's. However, the um, HA was found to have overall a very similar structure. It looked very, um, the, basically the same. However, it was found not to bind silic acid or any other glycan tested. And that was really big surprise because all flu A and flu B viruses bind silic acid. Uh, we do not know of an influenza virus that does not bind a glycan. And so this was really exciting for us as an entry lab. And at the time when these um, results had come out, um, Umut Karakos in the lab started his PhD. And we thought it would be a very good idea to um, at least aim towards identifying the receptor of these bat influenza A viruses. And we thought that would then start um, to allow us assessing the zoonotic potential of these viruses if we know about the receptor specificity. We were also quite interested in the plasticity of HA. If like the structure looks the same, but then the receptor is different, we thought that could be quite um, exciting. And then we also had this problem that we still didn't have the virus. And we thought if it's a unique receptor that's only expressed on certain um, cells, we might also help to rescue and grow, uh, grow this virus. And so um, this work is um, published, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it and just show you some of the key findings to then move on to the, the unpublished stuff. Um, in my lab, we used a transcriptomic analysis, and in parallel, our collaborators, the Schwemmle Lab at the University of Freiburg in Germany, used CRISPR-Cas9 screening to identify receptor candidates. And you will see that the results agreed very well. So what Umut did is he tested many different cell lines until he had three pairs of cell lines where uh, one cell was susceptible um, to a bad flu. Um, we used VLP um, for this because we didn't have the virus yet. And a closely related cell line was not susceptible. And so for these pairs of cell lines, we determined their transcriptome and then simply looked what the susceptible ones had in common that was absent in the non-susceptible ones. And we followed up on this with an RNAi screen on the candidates. And what we found is that it's HLA-DR, so one of the human MHC2 complexes that determines susceptibility. And Martin's lab came to the exact same conclusion with their CRISPR screen. So they used a susceptible cell line, this U87 MG cells, that they um, uh, run a CRISPR screen on. And for infection, they used a recombinant VSV that expressed H18, so the glycoprotein of the bat viruses. And this virus was lytic, and so they could enrich for surviving um, cells and then see what was knocked out in these cells. And as you can see in this scheme, what we agreed on or what was very clear, it's that's the HLA-DR beta chain and the HLA-DR alpha chain that seem very important for susceptibility. And these two chains come together and form the HLA-DR complex, um, um, one of the human MHC2s. The CRISPR screen also found a lot of these transcriptional regulators uh, of HLA-DR expression. So this was a very good candidate. And we then um, followed up on this, and I'm just showing you an example here. We had control um, cells that had high HLA-DR levels, and we then generated knockout um, cells. I'm showing you here two different clones. And when we in, where no HLA-DR expression was detectable, and when we infected these cells, you can see that in the control clone that has high HLA-DR levels, we had very good infection indicated by the green staining here. But in the knockout clones, there was really no infection at all. We really had a black and white phenotype. We also reconstituted this knock these knockout clones with HLA-DR and showed that we could rescue infection. So it was uh, quite clear and in line with the screens that this bad influenza virus, uh, virus infection was blocked in these HLA-DR um, knockout cells. And um, you might ask, so where does this virus come from? 
I said in the beginning, it was difficult to get it, but while doing these screenings and identifying um, susceptible cell lines, it also turned out that if you rescued the virus and grew it on these susceptible cells, that then we could generate the virus recombinantly. So that problem was already solved. And now we had a good receptor candidate. Um, we could also show that this uh, virus infection could be blocked by antibody pretreatment. So if we used an antibody against HLA-DR, pretreated the cells before infecting with virus-like particles, we saw the following. So if you first look over here, this is the control antibody, an anti-his um, antibody in this case. And if we um, treat cells with increasing concentrations of this antibody, nothing happens, not for the bat flu VLPs in red and not for a conventional flu VLP in H1N1. However, when we then pretreat cells with the anti-MHC2 um, antibody, we do see dose-dependent inhibition um, of the, the bat flu um, infection, whereas the control virus, the H1N1 virus, um, in this case as a VLP, was not affected. So this would also indicate that this uh, protein really plays a role very early in infection. Um, and then we um, also developed this assay in 293T um, cells that turned out very helpful and that I will also be talking about later. So 293T cells have no MHC class 2 on their surface. And this means you can infect them with virus-like particles that are pseudotyped with H1N1, so from a conventional influenza virus, but you cannot get any infection with the bat flu VLPs. However, when you transfect plasmids for the alpha and beta chain of HLA-DR, you can render them susceptible to bat flu um, VLPs and nothing changes for the conventional VLPs. And what we then saw is that it doesn't matter what kind of MHC class two we transfect. We tried here, for example, different homologs from the pig, from chickens, from three different bat species. And in all cases, there was no effect on conventional flu, but um, they all conferred susceptibility um, to bat flu um, VLPs. Um, and this means that you know, if um, MHC class two complexes from different species can function as entry receptor, that these viruses, at least at the level of entry, could have a broad host range and therefore zoonotic potential. So to us, that was quite an important um, finding. Um, we also went on to test this in vivo, um, and we infected black 6 mice. This was done in the lab um, of Martin Schwemmle, uh, black 6 uh, mice that uh, are MHC2 positive. And they harvested a lot of different organs. I'm showing you trachea, lung, and brain here. And most of these organs were negative. There was no detectable virus except for the upper airway. So this was really a localized infection upon intranasal infection. And the virus was replicating very well in the snout of these mice. And the advantage of mice is obviously that there are a lot of knockouts available. And so we used MHC class two knockout mice in the background of these black six um, mice. And when we infected those, there was really no detectable virus infection. It was again, this black and white um, phenotype, whereas the control, the regular black six mice showed very nice replication. Um, it might be that this intranasal infection is not the physiological route, so we're not claiming that we have an animal model of these viruses here for its, uh, for example, pathogenesis, but it is an in vivo system to show that you really require MHC um, class 2, and we want, went on to show that it's MHC2 on epithelial cells in the nose to really have this virus infection going. Um, and so with these um, data that I've shown you and some additional ones, we concluded that MHC2 mediates entry of bat influenza A viruses. And this was very surprising given the decades of research on flu virus entry that had shown that it's always silic acid that mediates entry. But somehow these um, slightly funny or odd bat viruses do not fit um, the scheme. 
Um, and we think this has some um, consequences or implications for the zoonotic potential. At the level of entry, these viruses could show a broad tropism. We could infect um, cells from any species that were MHC2 positive. Um, but we don't know yet if there are blocks then further downstream. And so far, there is also no evidence for pathogenicity. The mice did not get sick. And also when our collaborator, Martin, infected ferrets with these viruses, there was also no signs of disease. So there's no reason to um, get in panic or anything about these viruses. But the broad tropism at the level of entry does warrant further um, study of these viruses. We are also quite um, interested or excited by the plasticity of this um, HA protein. It can bind a proteinaceous receptor or a glycan, even though the overall structure is very, very similar. And for us, it was also raising some interesting questions regarding the evolution of influenza A viruses. Where do these bad viruses come from? Are they the older ones? And then the regular viruses have lost MHC2 mediated entry and developed silic acid based entry. Or is it the other way around? Or was there maybe an ancestor that could have both um, receptor um, specificities? And this was something that we thought we should um, test and we should look into. And this is what I want to talk about now in the second part. So as mentioned, these IAVs, HAs, they are all structurally conserved. And these bat flu I, um, HAs share approximately 45% amino acid sequence identity with the other ones. So we thought, could it not be that there is dual receptor specificity in some of the known um, HAs where we know that they bind salic acid, but maybe we've missed um, MHC class two uh, entry here. And in our bat flu studies, we had always used H1s or H7s as controls. And there we hadn't seen any MHC2 entry, but we thought maybe if we screen a larger panel. Um, and to do so, we used um, Kalu3 cells. So this is an airway epithelium derived um, cell line. Um, and we started off with an HLA-DR alpha knockout. So a single cell clone that did not have any HLA-DR on the surface anymore. And we reconstituted these cells either with a control lentivirus, so they would still be HLA-DR negative, or the HLA-DR alpha encoding lentivirus to restore high levels. And so the HLA-DR positive cells, they will always be in red and the negative ones in gray. For us, it was important that we really have the same genetic background in these cell lines. Um, and then we started off with a very small panel. This was actually one of the very first experiments that Mila, a new master student in the lab, um, did. So we had this small panel of just an H1, an H2, and an H3 influenza virus as a VLP. These are the three subtypes that have managed so far to establish lineages in humans. And we thought she could test those in these two cell lines. And to our big surprise already, this small panel revealed a hit. So for the H2N2 VLPs, she saw an approximately tenfold boost in VLP entry on these HLA-DR positive cells. And we were quite surprised about that because flu entry is usually very efficient and these Kalu cells have very high levels of salic acid. So to be able to see a boost was quite um, astonishing to us. Uh, we could then map this to the H2. So if we made VLPs that carried the H1 and then the N2, we did not have any enhancement when we look at HLA-DR cell lines versus control cell lines. However, if we use the H2, it doesn't matter which NA we have, we have this tenfold enhancement. So this HLA-DR expression can enhance H2N2 entry. And that um, was very interesting to us. We then tested a larger panel. And as you can see, for example, for this H5 or this H7 here, for most viruses tested, there was really no difference. However, there was again one where we saw this tenfold boost on the HLA-DR positive cells. And that was again an H2N2 isolate that we tested in this VLP assay here. 
Um, this was not restricted to VLPs. We also saw that for the authentic H2 virus. At the early time points, you have um, an increase in titer that levels out at the end, whereas the control virus um, replicated identically on both um, cell lines. So it's really H2N2 virus infection that is um, enhanced. What are these H2N2 influenza viruses? They entered the human population in 1957 when they replaced the H1s. And they themselves got replaced in 1968 when we had the H3N2 pandemic. So they only really circulated for 11 years and they do not circulate in humans anymore. However, the avian H2N2 viruses from which these um, are derived, at least the H2 segment, they still circulate in the avian reservoir. And these viruses in the avian reservoir are much more stable than the human ones. So they are very similar to the precursor of this pandemic. And we only have H2N2 reactive antibodies in people that are older than 54 years. So whoever was born before 1968 uh, has probably seen these viruses, whereas people that are born later on have not seen it. And so the population is becoming more and more susceptible to these H2 viruses. And we thought these are important ones to study and we should um, go on. We then wanted to know if this HLA-DR dependent entry, um, it can occur in a high silic acid level setting, but is it really independent of the silic acid? And to do so, Umo generated double knockout cells. So he started with HLA-DR knockouts and then uh, introduced the knockout of the silic acid transporter SLC35A1 that is known to be required for silic acid on the surface. And as you can see here, if you then infect these double knockouts, there is really no virus infection detectable if you infect with an H1N1 virus. Here is the control cell where you've only got the HLA-DR knockout, but you still have silic acid. And H1 uses silic acid, so you can infect, but not here. So these seem to be uh, the right model system to now look at HLA-DR um, mediated entry only. Um, here is then um, the fax characterization of the reconstituted cells. So we started again with a single cell clone of these double knockouts, and we introduced either an empty um, lentivirus to have cells that are neg negative for uh, HLA-DR and both types of salic acid, 2,3 and 2,6 linked. And we um, reconstituted cells with HLA-DR that are now HLA-DR positive, but still negative for both types of salic acid. And when we infect those with VLPs for H1, as expected, there's no infection, but with H2 VLPs, we now get infection on the HLA-DR positive cells in the absence of salic acid. And we can also show this here with the authentic virus. So it can occur independently of silic acid. It's really an alternative entry route um, for the virus. We also used the system to then show binding of the virus. So we had these uh, double knockouts that either have no HLA-DR in gray, and if you have nothing, no salic acid, no HLA-DR, you cannot bind H2N2 viruses to these cells. This is assessed by uh, flow cytometry here. However, if you do have HLA-DR on these cells, but no silic acid, you can detect binding of H2N2 viruses to these cells. So it's really the, the very initial um, binding or attachment of the virus that this HLA-DR um, can mediate. Um, we then wanted to know, so so far we had tested two or three different human H2 viruses and they all seem to show this enhancement, but we wanted to characterize some more. Um, so we got um, two, um, including Japan, this is the isolate we've been using um, so far. We included two additional human H2s. And again, we saw this tenfold boost in VLP infection when we express HLA-DR. 
When we then looked at the Asian, at the avian one, sorry, we distinguished between the Eurasian and the North American avian viruses. These are really two separate lineages for the H2 viruses. And we look, uh, if you look at the North American ones, they are mainly avian isolates, but there were also some swine infections that are included in this uh, group. And you can see there was really no difference here. In contrast for the Eurasian avian H2s, we did see a boost for quite a few of them, but there was also one where we didn't see a boost. And this made sense because the human one has come out of this group of viruses. So that goes um, together um, and made sense. But we thought we might also be able to use these differences between the human one and one of these ones that didn't show any difference to maybe map some amino acids that could be um, involved in this. And this is what we did. We created quite a number of chimeric HA constructs between the Japan isolate, so the one that shows the HLA-DR dependent entry, and the New York 78 H2 isolate that didn't show any enhancement. And we then mapped it first to a small uh, region in the HA1, and then mutated or looked at the individual amino acids that were different in this area. And we uh, ended up with a mutant that had four amino acid changes. And this is what I'm showing you here. So we found that in this chimera region that seemed to swap um, the phenotype, we had four amino acids that were critical, and these four were different between this Japan and New York um, isolate. If we have here the Japan where we have the enhancement, if we mutate only those four amino acids, 122, 124, 134, and 136, we completely lose this enhancement and it's the same. For New York, it's the other way around. The wild tip shows no um, or very little enhancement. If we now introduce those four amino acids only, we all of a sudden have a boost of HLA-DR dependent entry. So swapping of four amino acids in this H2 background changes the ability to use HLA-DR for host cell entry. So we were keen to highlight these amino acids on the structure. And this is what you see here. To be honest, we had hoped for a much nicer patch, a really like a binding pocket where all of these four amino acids cluster together. Uh, however, this is what we got. So in green, we have the conventional receptor binding site. This is like a pocket where the sialic acid um, sits and can uh, mediate binding. And in yellow and purple together, this would be the area of the chimera that we mapped to swap the phenotype. And the purple ones are then those four amino acids that we had found to be um, critical within the H2 background. And you see 134 and 136, they are very nicely surface exposed and you could um, see how that was involved in an interaction. However, the other two 124 and S, um, 124 and 122, they are somewhat hidden on the inside. So um, we think this are more um, structural changes that they mediate. We think it's unlikely that they are in direct um, contact and it'll require quite some work to figure out why these are important. However, what was quite nice to see was when we then um, uh, use the available H2 uh, sequences of um, the known isolates that were available. And we looked for the conservation at these um, amino acids. We saw that all the human H2 isolates have these four amino acids very well conserved. And so this would explain why all of the human isolates tested show this enhancement. For the North American ones where we didn't see any enhancement, only one of those four um, is conserved, and we know from mutagenesis that that one is not enough to mediate enhancement. The Eurasian ones are somewhat in between. When you look at all the isolates, three out of the four are conserved, and it actually fit that the ones that showed the enhancement had these three conserved, whereas the one that didn't show the enhancement as the exception actually only had two conserved and had the blue residue derived from New York or similar to uh, New York here at this position. So these amino acids really match the phenotype um, that we see. 
And from this, we hypothesize or we suggest that HLA-DR binding happens close to the silic acid binding. However, that it's a distinct um, site that doesn't overlap uh, with silic acid um, binding. It's really separate. Um, this is now all very um, interesting to us, but the question is, is this really relevant? What happens in vivo? You already have silic acid receptor specificity. There's plenty of silic acid on the airway epithelium. So does this make a change um, to the virus? And this is obviously the big question that we're now interested um, to answer. And I have to say, we do not have the answer yet. I can only share the hypothesis and the approaches that we're using so far. This is something that we're working on right now. We think that the ability to use MHC2 to enter host cells will impact virus tropism because the distribution of HLA-DR expression or MHC2 um, expression is different from the distribution of alpha-23 versus alpha-26 linked silic acid. And we also think that it will impact viral infection efficiency because we've seen on our Kalu cells, they have very high levels of silic acid. They are very good at replicating influenza viruses. And even in that setting, we saw a boost. And for many influenza viruses, it has been shown that replication speed is really important to kind of outrun the innate immune response. So if a virus is fast, this means that it will be um, successful and that usually also pathogenesis is worse if it's really fast at the beginning. And this is something we would like to test. What we started with is our primary airway cultures. So these are derived from human tissue samples from the nose or from the bronchi. They are de-differentiated from these tissue samples, and we can then re-differentiate cells on a, a transwell um, setting so that we really get an epithelium with the different cell types um, present in there. And when we did, these are really the sites where influenza replication and propagation takes place in vivo. And so when we looked at HLA-DR expression in this epithelium, we, we were somewhat surprised to see that the cultures were highly positive for HLA-DR. These are in the reddish colors, three donors for bronchial cultures. And here we have three donors for nasal cultures. You see there, one of the three has low levels, but the other two have high levels of HLA-DR. And here it's similar, two donors with a high level and one with an intermediate level. Um, and we didn't quite expect that from the literature. So this is also something we need to follow up on. But we imagine that on this airway epithelium that the HLA-DR entry could contribute and speed up uh, virus replication. To test that, we have started with a recombinant VSV virus that encodes either the wild type H2 from Japan, which does mediate this entry. And we've also made a 4X mutant with these four amino acids changed. And you can see in this example from two donors, from a bronchial and a nasal culture, that the, the titers or the replication of this uh, 4X mutant is substantially lower than the one from the wild type. So our preliminary data suggests that HLA-DR dependent entry can increase infection levels, but we obviously need to confirm this on additional donors. And most importantly, we need to generate proper recombinant influenza A viruses, um, not just um, the VSVs. And we're currently working on these. Unfortunately, they are genetically a bit unstable and are giving us uh, quite some headache, but um, we're working on those. We thought in the meantime, we could maybe go into mice that has worked very well for the bat flu um, virus. So we thought we should test MHC class two complexes from different species for their impact on H2 entry. And the results were quite interesting, but also quite annoying for our purpose, I have to say. You see here in red, the bat flu VLPs. And again, as shown before, any MHC2 led to a boost of infection including the two from mice, H2A and H2E. They are the MHC2s from mice. 
However, when we then tested H2N2, we saw that also quite a few of them worked, but now we also have some H2s that do not boost infection. Here you don't start with zero because you already have some silic acid-based entry. And you can see that only one of the mouse MHC2s um, works, the H2A does not. And this is a problem because the black six mice that we've used before, they unfortunately do not have any functional H2A, uh, e, sorry, they only have H2A and that doesn't work. So we can't really use our mouse um, model. We're currently looking into alternative uh, mouse models for this, but we have not really found um, anything yet. So the priority at the moment is the recombinant influenza viruses that differ in disability that we would then use uh, on mice that are H2E uh, positive, where we don't have the MHC2 knockout background. Um, so with this, I'm at the end. So I hope could convince you that MHC2 mediates entry of not only bat flu, but also human and some avian H2 influenza A viruses. And this means that dual receptor specificity is possible. And maybe these bat flu viruses are not as weird as we initially um, thought. The big question now obviously is what is the role of this entry in vivo in the context of dual receptor specificity? For the bat flu ones, we know it's critical, but they can't use silic acid, but we wanna know what happens if you have both specificities. We also want to know how the MHC2 dependent entry compares to silic acid dependent entry um, cell biology wise. So what happens post receptor engagement, which host factors are involved, what's the pathway. So a, a PhD student in lab is addressing that with um, CRISPR-Cas9 um, screenings to compare uh, both types of entry in parallel. And we're still very interested in this evolution of the flu A viruses. You know, we don't know, we can't say um, anything about an ancestor, but at least we can now conclude that an ancestor with the ability to use both is possible. And maybe then both lines have evolved um, in parallel and lost one or the other pathway, or for a few of them kept both. And it will obviously be very exciting to find out why some have kept both and others have not. And then maybe the most important question is, what is the role of this entry process in zoonotic transmission? Could it be that the avian H2s that um, successfully started a pandemic, these H2N2 viruses in 57, could it be that this MHC class two entry, because they can recognize mammalian MHC um, two, that this was somehow involved in the initial steps? And if this is a case, then we probably need to monitor the current avian H2s from the Eurasian lineage a bit more closely because maybe this could then happen again. So uh, we're currently collecting or trying to collect some of these Eurasian um, avian H2 virus isolates to then test their potential to infect uh, mammalian cells. And then most importantly, I would like to thank the people who did the work. And a lot of it was work from Umut. The bat flu story was really done by him in my um, group in collaboration with all these other people, especially Martin Schwemmler's lab in Freiburg. And then the H2 um, work was uh, done by Umut when he stayed on as a postdoc um, and was um, together with Mila, who's a PhD student now, who really made this initial discovery with the H2. And now Patricia, Laura, Marie, and Annika in the lab um, are helping to build um, and expand on this H2 um, story. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you. And I'm happy to answer questions. Okay. Great, thank you so much. Do we have any questions um, from the audience, preferably starting with the trainee? Okay, well, Irene's gonna take that first. <laughs> um, do you see any structural similarities between the MHC class two and other cyalic, at the normal, um, typical uh, receptor for uh, influenza viruses? Are there any similarities where what you found on uh, MHC uh, class two is found a, a motif would be found in typical since it seems like the 
HA of I, uh, these influenza viruses don't necessarily um, differ all that much structurally. Yeah, you, you hinted a very good point. And so for the conventional flus, the idea is really that it only binds silic acid. And somehow, you know, this is then not specific to certain protein receptors. And somehow this is supposed to trigger endocytosis. But it's clearly not possible that any silic acid binding on any glycolipid or glycoprotein will trigger endocytosis. That's not going to happen. There has to be a certain specificity. But we really, really don't know which proteins that are silylated can induce um, the uptake. So this is also something we're looking into. But there we think we have the problem of redundancy. It doesn't seem to be just one um, silylated receptor, but there seem to be a number of them. And it's then very tricky um, to show functional relevance. So at the moment, we have no uh, hint that there is any similarity, but this is mainly based on the fact that we don't know the internalization uh, determinant for flu other than the silic acid. Okay, we have a question from the chat from Francisco, um, and his question is, are MHC, uh, MHC class 2 glycosylated, and if so, do they carry sialic acid? Could it be a stepwise entry process? Mm -hmm. um, so we have, um, there are three described N-glycosylation sites on MHC2, and we have mutated them individually. Um, and then we still get regular entry. So it's not a specific site. However, when we mutate all at the same time, we don't get MHC2 to the cell surface anymore. And then obviously we don't get entry. Um, but what we have done is we've treated cells with high levels of neuraminidase that also remove silic acid, then the MHC2 entry proceeds as normal. Um, so we think it is not um, linked in any way. We really think it's two entirely separate um, processes at this point, yeah. Okay, cool. Sorry, Melanie, but Rahul, do you want to ask your question? Uh, sure. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, hi, so uh, very nice presentation. Uh, interesting work. Uh, may I know uh, what are these nasal or bronchial cultures are? Uh, are they differentiated cells? They are a tissue type or you know, what it exactly is? Um, so these primary airway cultures have been around for a while and they're based on human tissue samples. So either from the nose or from surgeries, we have them from bronchi or from the small airway um, airways. And after um, removal of this human tissue, there are protocols to de-differentiate the cells, then you can freeze them. And we can then thaw them and have, expand them uh, for one or two passages, see them on trans wells, and then with certain media start differentiation that we then um, validate. So you get different cell types, ciliated cells, secretory cells, basal cells, you get mucus production, you get the beating cilia that then move the mucus. And these cultures support very high levels of virus replication. So they were great for flu, but also for coronaviruses. Um, virus isolates that we can't grow on regular cell lines often uh, grow really well on these primary cultures. Um, so the, they are very good model. They're just very difficult to modify genetically. That's a bit of that drawback. Melanie. Thanks. <clears throat> Great talk. Um, I have a question. Does, does Do the bad viruses downregulate the HL, uh, the, the MHC? Uh, mm -hmm. on the surface and is there any pathology that could come towards that or is that sort of a defense mechanism of the virus um, mm -hmm. see any changes to them um so our collaborator has looked more into that and martin has seen that in cells that are infected with the bat flu virus the um hladr levels were lower um, and they also saw that maybe the expression of the NA alone could have some effect on these levels. So you would again have this um, receptor binding, receptor destroying function on HANA. However, the, the finding with the NA mediating this down regulation, we have not been able to reproduce that. And we also haven't seen anything for the N2. So this is something we need to revisit with the full um, viruses, but that yeah, would be very nice um, if you had, again, this balance and would then also have implications, as you say, for pathogenicity. 
Thanks. Okay, Irene, you have a couple. Um, <laughs> do bat uh, influenza have uh, like the newer with the newer uh, uh, receptor? Does it have broader organ tropism within the bat? Are there differences that you see? Or um, so th um, there are no bat colonies from these species where the viruses have been found. Um, and had, they had to try a few different bat species that are available as an animal model in the lab. Um, and they have found one, to be honest, I don't remember um, the name. This is work by uh, Martin's um, lab. And there they saw that they really only get infection if it's uh, the gastrointestinal route, um, if they put the virus, for example, in the water or in the food. Um, and then they get very nice rep virus replication in the gastrointestinal tract and shedding uh, via feces, but not really um, um, disease. Um, and given that the genomic sequences were also found from fecal um, samples, and this was confirmed from an independent group later on that found the same viruses in fecal sample or um, sequences at least, not fully viruses, um, we think that it's a gastrointestinal infection in the bat, which is similar to the avian host. In the waterfowl, it's also flu A is a gastrointestinal infection, and only in the mammals it's then respiratory. Cool. Um, I guess this plays nicely into my next question is, do you see any differences in, in immune responses with this new receptor uh, versus uh, influenza that bind other ones? Yeah, we haven't um, started looking um, into that. These bat um, experiments are, are really um, difficult and expensive to do. Martin had, has done a few initial ones to see, to test different routes in collaboration with um, Tony Shams, um, but we haven't really done um, anything more. They are now aiming to do an infection again and looking at different um, uh, cell types from this gastrointestinal um, tract to determine tropism, um, but we haven't started to look into the immune response to the bat virus. And for the H2, we're still um, yeah, working on setting up the, the in vivo model before we can address those questions. Um, I'll take a moment to ask a question. In your primary tissue culture models, were you having a diverse uh, cell um, population? Maybe I missed this, and you probably mentioned this, but are you seeing a specific cell type um, or target, you know, population from the viruses that are infect better infected or not? Um, so in our standard cell lines, what we see is that we need quite high levels of HLA DR. Um, the range is usually quite draw, uh, broad. We have um, cells that have high levels and some that are intermediate, and the infection is usually uh, limited to the ones that have high um, levels. In the primary cultures with the different cell types, we haven't started um, to assess which cell types are infected by the virus. This is high up on the list though to see. Um, and we would like to see then or expect to see overlap with HLA-DR um, expression that's um, ongoing. Question in the chat, do any other viruses use HLA-DR for entry? Uh, yes, there are other viruses. There are, um, for example, Epstein-Barr virus from the herpes viruses uses it. Um, and for the bat virus, at some point, we collected proteins that bind MHC and tried to test um, if we could block um, infection to kind of map the interaction um, site. And we were very keen on getting the, the extracellular part of the herpes um, virus glycoprotein, but um, this didn't um, work out. So we don't know um, if the binding site is different um, or the same, if they could be used to block um, each other in a, in a cell culture system. That would be interesting to look at. But it's not the only viruses that use it, even though it sounds at first glance, I think, as an odd choice for a receptor. Are there any other questions? You can unmute yourself to ask your question, raise your hand, type it in the chat. And if not, it's midday here in California for all of us, but I know it's getting into the late evening for you um, <laughs> over in <laughs> Switzerland. <laughs> um, and we just really want to thank you for your time. And this was a great talk. Thank you for the invitation, the chance to present some of our work. Really enjoyed it chatting with you as well.
Thank okay. you so much. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye. Good night. Bye.